Good evening. Special greetings to the newly fully ordained, right? Two fully ordained, then others. Novice monk or non ordination. And of course, to all of you. <clears throat> the topic I'm supposed to talk about is the four seals, sometimes translated as four promulgations. This is a topic that I will be elaborating in my five days teaching in May. So, <clears throat> but anyway, how many of you attended my talks before? None. One or two? At least one or two, yeah. Yes. Some veterans, yeah. Okay, so I'm just out of curiosity asking. So I think whatever we do, we need to pause and ask the question, why am I doing this? Right? Number one, of course, you have every right to do whatever you like. <laughs> this is my fundamental philosophy. <laughs> if it doesn't harm you and harm others, you have every right to do whatever you want. <laughs> That's one of my philosophy. Then on top of that, it is important also to develop the realization. There are things bigger than you and me. We call it law of nature or whatever you want to call it. There are things larger than you and me. So one should not get lost just with oneself. Then, of course, to make a long story short, whatever we do, be it religious study or business or whatever we do, any human activities we do, we are, we are supposed to be doing that primarily for happiness, right? Happiness and peace. If you think, sit down and think carefully, then we'll all agree and say this is for my happiness and peace. When you're not so thinking, then you end up doing all these things for pleasures. Right? So this we need to know very clearly right in the beginning. Do you want just fleeting pleasures or a little bit long-lasting happiness and peace? The choice is yours. But the interesting thing is, <laughs> I've asked this question to many places, in many countries, to many people. Do you want happiness? Everybody says, yes, sir, I want happiness. Then I tease them by saying, for how many days you want happiness? Then they just, as you're doing, then they, you know, start smiling. Meaning that they want happiness as long as possible. So this wish to have long-lasting happiness, uh, happiness and peace is not necessarily something that you have learned from your religion. It is your innate desire. Immediately after the birth of the child, the first thing that the child does is crying. By crying, even by crying, the child is asking for happiness. The child is saying, I have a lot of problem. I don't know how to solve it. Huh? I have no hair on my head, no teeth in my mouth. I came naked, no clothes, no nobody, you know. Please help me. So at that time, the, the mother or whoever is caretaker, because of the love, shown by that mother primarily, the child is able to survive. And the love, at that time, the child is also asking for not just love, but unconditional love. Because the child has, at that time, nothing to give back. And the mother also, whoever is the caregiver, gives that unconditional love. This is, I think, how we started our life, and this is, I think, very, very important for us to remember. Few things we need to remember. When you leave this hall, <laughs> you need to take this. I want long-lasting happiness. Second, 
unconditional love was the source of nourishment, happy life, right from the birth. Unconditional love. Why, why I'm laying emphasis on this word unconditional love? Because as we grow up, then love is still there, but the love most of the time becomes business love. I love you so much, so long as you love me. This is business love, right? So Buddhism is not teaching business. <laughs> unconditional love. Unconditional love, genuine love is unconditional love. Unconditional love happens when you realize that others are exactly like me, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. Exactly. Then why, why, how, why do you think you are especially important, you know? And we do everything for oneself, whether you're educated, not educated, but you know, you feed yourself, you clothe yourself, you do whatever you want, at least you do the running to do something for yourself, right? Year and, and year in and year out, we do that. Having seen this, if somebody out of curiosity <laughs> asks you this question, ma'am, I saw you taking so much care about yourself, why? You will be shocked <laughs> when somebody asks you this question. Then what, what will be your answer? You cannot give it, you can, of course, but it is not the right answer to say that I take so much care about myself because I am a very famous Buddhist monk or I did my PhD or I'm a scientist. You know, you can give all this, all kind of answers, but that's not the right answer. The right and correct answer is I do so much about myself because I want happiness, do not want suffering. Right? If this is the case, then you should also equally take care of others because they also want happiness, do not want suffering. When you put this point forward, then they will, they will try to be clever and they will say, yeah, yeah, that is true, but who am I to take care of their happiness and suffering? They'll take care of themselves, I'll take care of myself. We think like that. When you think like that, you are really thinking, you know, in terms of as if there is no connection between you and others, which is absolutely not true. Because whether you know other people or not, you are connected to others. Directly, indirectly, especially in today's world, when, when we are thrown into the face of each, each other through the speed of science and technology, you know. When you have your breakfast in America, lunch in Europe, and dinner in India, things like that, you know. And then, then with the internet, mobile phone, you know, we are so closely connected. And then the earth we share, environment in, environment in which we live, you know. This is our only home. The moon and other planets may look nice, but you will, I, think, I don't think you will find a better place other than this earth to go there. So these are like, whether you call it Buddhist teaching or not Buddhist teaching, that doesn't make sense. But what I'm trying to say right in the beginning is, we, our life is in such a way that harming other is, others is harming yourself. Whether it's between country to country, person to person, you know, whatever. If you're harming others, you're harming yourself. You are, if you're harming the environment, you are harming yourself and everybody. We need to develop this kind of larger global awareness and consciousness. Time has come, it's very, very urgent, because on the one hand, we have these tools given by science, mobile phone and other technologies in our hand, right? And because of this, we are all distracted to whatever is there in that mobile phone. And we go more and more outward. Now, artificial intelligence is also waiting. You will get more, I'm not saying they are totally nonsense and no benefit at all because I don't have that knowledge to make that <laughs> point. But all I'm saying is, I am pretty sure that we'll get, unless we have some inner resources, we'll get more and more distracted towards outside. And the danger with that kind of approach is, as we have already known during the COVID-19 experience, you know, when we face some threat, some problem, difficult to deal with, and at that time, the only thing that will become useful is if you have these inner resources to pull out. And during COVID-19, even in developed countries, many young people committed suicide because 
Normally, they are always outward going, you know. You eat outside, lunch is outside, dinner is outside, moving with friends, and then suddenly you say, okay, stay within your room. When your lockdown has happened, you know, people don't know how to live. That is the tragedy. It has, it has been tragedy since ages. Some of the Tibetan teachers, a long time back, they said the problem with us human beings is we don't know how to live with others and also don't know how to live alone. You should be good in one of these two things. <laughs> you see? Either you should know how to live with others, with love, with kindness, with compassion, with harmony, or like the great meditators, few great meditators, you should know how to go within yourself, explore the richness of your, you know, internal qualities, and just be happy as if you are already achieved nirvana enlightenment. You are happy, you know, you, 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 you don't have to do much with others. So whatever be the case, we need to seriously develop these inner qualities. This is nothing to do with a particular religion. The word spirituality is even better than the word religion. Spirituality, something to do with our inner core, human spirit, human mind, loving kindness, compassion, harmony, patience, forgiveness, you know, the universal spiritual qualities must be there. Because it is our, in our gene. For your health, physical health, mental health, friendship, if you have these inner qualities, you know, even when you encounter all these ups and downs in life, you, you will still be able to maintain your sanity. These days people have, you know, started asking the question, what should be the education system in, let us say, in year 2050 or something like that. There's no proper answer. Because things are changing at such a great speed, you have no idea what will be the situation in 2050. And all the things that you've learned right now, be it technology or other things, skills that you've learned, may be outdated at that time. You might lose your job, which happened in many countries already. So at that time, how will you maintain your sanity? You will be able to maintain your sanity <laughs> only if you have these inner resources. And of course, we don't have to wait until 2050. Even right now, you know, suddenly one of your best friend, family member dies, your most beloved son, daughter, brother, sister dies. If you don't have these inner resources, if you have no understanding of the larger perspective, again, you will die of shock. Right? So therefore, in order to, if you really want that long-lasting happiness, then the main cause for that long-lasting happiness is not outside, it is within you. You need to explore, recognize, strengthen these inner qualities so that whatever is happening, you are happy. It's not easy. We need training, but it is possible. Just like His Holiness Dalai Lama. He lost his country. He's now almost like 90, still smiling and helping people, you know. Right? So that, that is really important because, I mean, I mean, sometimes, you know, with this modern science and technology, especially the misuse of technology, false science and technology falls in the hand of some lunatics, which is already happening. The world has now, I think, something like 20,000 atom bombs. How many people can be killed just by one atom bomb? <laughs> Imagine. So here we need Buddhist teaching, because Buddhist teaching, Buddhist teaching says, you don't have to kill people, they'll die. Such a simple, profound wisdom, you know. <laughs> really, if you, you know, when we don't think carefully, then you think, especially if you get some money, some name, some fame, then you get puffed up, oh, I'm somebody special, you know. But if you really look carefully, you know, look at this body, you know. Outside it looks okay, because it's plastered with the skin, and then especially if you use some nice creams, maybe look nice. <laughs> but inside, go inside. 
how the lungs function, how the internal organs function, you know. They're all fragile. According to the modern system of packaging also, anything that is fragile is packed nicely. <laughs> so clearly showing that we are fragile because all, everything is packed nicely. This is called impermanent. In Buddhism we call it impermanent, meaning fragility. <laughs> so when people are already fragile, already prone to problem sufferings, even if you are unable to reduce a little bit of their suffering, you should not become an extra burden. Right? So if you live the life properly, your life may be just for two days. Okay, no problem. Some of the flowers, they, 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 you know, they are there for two days. And during these two days, they make everybody happy, you know. They give that fragrance, they look at the color, you know. <laughs> they, then gone, you know, there, there, there is a story of once having a debate between the, the, the flower and the thorn. That, that comes with the flower. And that the thorn despised the flower and said, what, what kind of life, miserable life you have? You are here only for one or two days and then you like disappear, you, you, you fall. Look at me, the thorn, you know? I've seen many of your generation still, see? Strong, if anybody tries to touch me, I prick them, you know, send them away. <laughs> Then the flower said, yes, 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 you may, be, you may have been living very long, but you have been a source of problem for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I was here for maybe one or two days, but I made everybody happy. That is it. Because many people think, if I live very, very long, then I can achieve something. No. Number one, because you are not, not so sure how long you are going to live. And if you misuse your life, no point living very, very long. I'm not saying you commit suicide, but... <laughs> But there, there's, there's really not much point, you know, <laughs> right? Right? So there was a story of a, a gentleman who lived for 1,000 years. And when he was uh, 1,000 years old, the Lord of the death came and he said, hey, you lived very long. It's time to go. You need to die. Then the old man said, yes, I know I lived very long, but in the course of his 1,000 years, he married 100 wife and has over 100 uh, children, and some of them are really like over 800 years or seven, 700 years like that, you see, respectively. So the old man said, yes, I know I lived very long, but I don't want to go, so take one of my son. <laughs> <laughs> so the Lord of the... Lord of the death goes to the, the eldest son. The, the eldest son also says the same thing. Take the next one, next one. Goes all the, everybody's reluctant to die. And finally, the Lord of the, the death or messenger of the death goes to the youngest one who was only 15 years old. Do you want to go? And he said, yes, yes, I want to go. He was very excited. And then the messenger, messenger of the death was confounded. He said, since your father and all your elder brothers are so reluctant to go, why you get so excited? He said, I'm very excited because if my father and br brothers didn't get anything after living so long, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I'm going to get anything <laughs> by living long. That's, that's an old Indian story, you know. It gives a very beautiful message, you see. So, so it's important to live a meaningful, happy life. And that happy life has to start today, right now, not tomorrow. Not after you finish your study or after you're married, no. <laughs> right now, be happy. And there are many reasons to be happy. Many reasons to be happy because now you are a, you are a human being with this amazing capacity to think, and you are the only animal in the world who is able to smile and show the teeth and hug somebody and shake the hand, you know, right? And then this great intelligence, no other animals have that. And the only animal that's going able to, you know, go uh, straight, you know, straight on the two legs and use mobile phone, call, you know, so, so, many things. so many different features, right? So that intelligence must be used to find the long-term causes for happiness and peace. And this language and speech must be used 
for dialogue and negotiation when there is a problem, when there is a disagreement. If there is a disagreement between the tigers and lions, then they cannot say, let us sit down and talk, <laughs> because they don't have their language. So the only thing they can do is pounce upon each other and try to tear each other apart. But in our case, we have this very sophisticated language. So if there is a problem, don't get angry. Say, please, you know, let us sit down and talk. Anything can be solved. So in the international politics, we need to have that kind of thinking. Not that, oh, if you do this, I'll bomb you, kill you. Look at what is happening between Russia and Ukraine, and what is happening in the Middle East and elsewhere. It's unfortunate. Very unfortunate. So therefore you should, all of us should consider we are lucky. We are lucky because number one, I really honestly speaking, I don't feel like talking much because talking to people like you is like preaching to the convert. Only good people come. <laughs> people who want to do nasty negative things, they are, they are somewhere else. Will not come. So you're already good. So I really compliment you, appreciate you. You are making your life meaningful. But of course, there is not the end of the story. You have to make more effort to refine yourself, improve yourself. So that's why it's wonderful to hit organizes this kind of teachings on and off, which will benefit many people. So the only way to solve international or national or you know problems in the society is us, individuals. We need to create this ripple effect. So we should not say that this is, I'm not president, I'm not prime minister, I have no... Some people say, ah, oh, in this world, you're just like a cog in the wheel, there's nothing you can do. When the giant wheel moves, you also have to move. I don't agree with that. If you're a cog in the wheel, if the cog comes apart, <laughs> the giant wheel will stop. So we should never lose our you know, hope and expectation and uh, be happy that if you are able to bring smile on the face of even one person. That's what I try to do. I, I know nothing better than you, but I, I practice a little bit of how to make people a little bit smile, you know, over a cup of tea, whatever, that's it. That we can all do. And once your mind is happy, you can do anything. When your mind is disturbed, you can't forget about concentration. Forget the wisdom that they will speak here. <laughs> will not be able to even get to sleep, right? So therefore, the real enemy is not outside, it is within us. If there is an external enemy, however horrible that external enemy may be, we can still run away from that person, hide from that person. Or if caught, plead, please spare my life, I'll do whatever you, you say. But with this internal enemy of negative emotions, where are you going to run away? And especially we human beings have this tendency of thinking that anything that is there with, within you is good. If, you, if I ask you, is anger good? You will say anger is not good. But if I, I, I say, why did you get angry yesterday? Then you will say, there is a reason. This is how we try to justify our wrongdoings, you see. Right? Right? So. Right? So therefore, one thing that we need to seriously know, whether you call it concentration, meditation, morality, there are so many things to be studied, but the target of all your Buddhist practice is, whether you do sutric practice or tantric practice, whatever, recite mantra, meditation, whatever you do, the target is how to defeat this internal enemy of afflictive emotions. And they are not going to go away so easily because you are habituated with these negative emotions for so long, according to Buddhism, for many lives. So therefore, even if you are able to reduce a little bit of the intensity of these negative emotions, for example, if you are a very hot-tempered person, then after attending these teachings, or your, through your life's experiences, if you're able to reduce the strength of that negative emotion, like anger, a little bit, you will be happier. And that actually is a miracle. 
Miracle is not just opening a third eye or the forehead, things like that. If you're really, really, even if you're able to fly, there's nothing. We're all, birds have been flying for so long, you know. There's, there's nothing, you know. If you're able to reduce your negative emotions a little bit, negative computation, jealousy, anger, hatred, you know. So there, there it's important for us not only read Buddhist book, books, but use your common sense. For example, anger. Is there anybody who right in the morning makes a motivation and plan saying, today I will get angry? Anybody? No, that means you have some idea that anger is not good. <laughs> but unfortunately, in the course of the day, you meet some strange people or you get tired, whatever you do, get angry sometimes and then pick up a fight with somebody. Having done that it, at the close of the day, having returned to your home, when you reflect back and realize that you got angry and fought with somebody, is there anybody who's, who says that today I fought with somebody, I was angry, so I really enjoyed my day? Nobody there, right? Then all of us want to be a presentable person. We, we don ourselves with nice ornaments and use cosmetics and make sure that your color is all right and make sure that you know, hair is combed, things like that. And after donning yourself, if you get angry, with, with gold earrings, you get angry, you know. You're not handsome anymore. You're not beautiful anymore. And even if you don't have any of these decorations, ornaments, if you have this smile on your face, you look, look very handsome, just like the Buddha statue, or you look at His Holiness Dalai Lama statue. He doesn't use any makeup. Right? So, and this smile, this smile, genuine smile, I'm not talking about any kind of smile because there are politician smiles, sarcastic smiles, you know, I'm not talking about genuine smile. The genuine smile comes when you're mentally, you are mentally really peaceful and calm. And when you are really peaceful and calm, I read it in the text by the Buddha himself in the Sutra. When your mind is really calm, then there is proper blood circulation throughout your body, proper flow of energy. And because of this proper circulation of blood, you know, your, your face will also look radiant because of the blood, right? Then, then you handsome person, beautiful women, things like that. And once you are able to develop this kind of inner beauty, which is reflected in the external beauty, that's real beauty. No thieves can steal, no robbers can rob. Your other ornaments, you know, <laughs> when you put, you know, gold earrings, somebody may be watching there, you see. There are cases, sometimes some looters, they just snatch your gold chain, you know, things like that. Right? So, so there are 100,000 like qualities of inner, qual inner qualities. The external collections, you know, when you travel also, they all become excess baggage. And Buddha said, don't, don't keep excess baggage. Nobody listened. Now at the airport, they will tell you, Madam, sorry, excess baggage. You can't take more than 15 kilos. You have to pay for it, you see. If you don't listen to Buddha, that's the... <laughs> <laughs> Why am I saying this? Because truth is truth, you know. If you don't listen to truth from wherever it is coming, you will have to suffer. Right? So there are so many things like that. So therefore, the point that I'm making is try to practice unconditional love. Appreciate this extremely rare, you know, possibility to have this precious human life. Recognize it. Take good care of yourself. Right? When we meet and separate, then say, bye, take care. Right? Nobody says, bye, I'll take care of you. This is, this is teaching of the Buddha. Buddha said, self is the protector of the self, no one else can be the protector. Self is the enemy of the self, no one else can be the enemy. We are very fond of, you know, pointing to someone else. But the truth is, those that are outside of you, whether you like it or not, you have not much control. 
the only thing over which you have control is how would you react to the event situations happening to you, due to other people, due to sunshine, due to snow, you know. Right now, for example, it's quite cold. Now, when you experience this coldness, there are only two ways of reacting to it. One, you start cursing the coldness. Go hell with this cold weather in Dharamsala. You get angry. You stomp your food on the ground. Hit on the table. <laughs> Just by doing this, will the, will the cold weather say, Madam, sorry, I'll be a little bit warmer. I'll become a little bit warmer. It will not say. You're creating unnecessary problem upon yourself. So instead of getting angry, you understand, okay, this is winter, you know. And also now, because of our own doing, climate is changing, so I better like wear warm cloth, things like that, you see. So how would you react to the changing situations, events that is in your hand? Not other people, not that is outside of you, the weather or whatever. So there, the point that I'm making is things, there are things you can change, there are things you cannot change. Things you can change, don't worry, because you can change. It may take some time, you may have to make some effort, but you can change. Things you can't change, no, no use wasting your time. For example, if I, ha I have you know, lost my left hand, there are only two ways of dealing with that. One is for the rest of my life I should think how miserable I am, I have you know, lost my left hand and you know, feel miserable and feel sad for the rest of the life. By doing that, will the left hand come back? No. So instead of thinking about that, you think about the right hand. You have the right hand, which is the one which do, do, does most of the writing and you know, responsible for doing many things. There are many people who don't have not only the two hands, but also two legs. I have seen myself, people who have no, both the hands and legs are meeting, missing, still they are trying to live with smile. So positive, think about the good side, not only about complaining, you know. Oh, I'm so, I'm so unfortunate, I am not Bill Gates, huh? Oh, I'm so unfortunate, I lost my Tibet, you know. If I, if I keep on counting all this, then I can make myself very sad, you see. So I keep on talking this kind of thing. So sometimes people chase me by saying, Geshele, you've been talking about happiness. Are you really happy? You've been saying this to other people. Are you really happy? Then, you know, then I tell them, yes, I'm happy. Why? Don't you live alone? See, happiness means you have to live with somebody, for some people. Do you live alone? Yes, I said, I live alone. Are you still happy? Yes, I'm happy. Why? Because I have a place to live. There's no war going on here in Dharamsala. And I have something to eat. And I've, I'm, I'm surrounded by good friends here and there, you see. So I'm happy. What else you want, you see? So it's a state of mind. So there should be kind of contentment. The contentment doesn't mean you should not make effort. You should make effort, try your best to achieve whatever you want to achieve. But if Unable to achieve then, okay, I tried. Didn't come, so I, I'm not going to waste my life for those things which I could not achieve. There's so many other things I need to do, you see. So like that. So mental attitude is very, very important. Okay, so this is just a little bit precursor to my talk. And the point that, that we are basically talking about is the four seals taught by the Buddha. When the Buddha got enlightened, okay, now let us recall that tomorrow is the uh, uh, 15th uh, of the special month. And uh, for the next 15 days, it is said that the Buddha performed many miracles. And he performed these many miracles because at his time there were uh, many non-Buddhist teachers also living, especially the six non-Buddhist teachers. So Buddha became so famous, everybody was following him and going to him and making all the offerings to him and hardly anybody visiting the other teachers, so they got jealous. They said, we must do something. 
And then they said, let us ask him to, you know, engage with us in a competition of showing miracles. And whoever wins then will be the boss. <laughs> Something like that. So then, then this, you know, performance has happened. In the beginning, the, the, these non-Buddhist teachers, they contacted Bimbisara, who was a very close friend of the Buddha, and who used to say, whenever I go to see the Buddha, I really feel like I'm sitting at the foot of a huge tree, which giving shadow, you know, I feel so peaceful and comfortable. So they were very good friends. So this non-Buddhist teacher goes to him and requests that please organize a miracle competition. I said, what? You're going to compete with Buddha? You get lost, you stupid bunch of fellow. <laughs> Something like that. He dropped them away. And then again they approach. They said, if you come here for a third time, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll punish you like anything. Then, you know, they go to a next teacher. The next teacher somehow organizes this miracle and it makes the request to the Buddha. And then the Buddha said that my teaching is for benefiting others and not harming others, not accumulating any negative deeds and sins. It's not for performing miracles. I can't do this. Then repeated request was made and then on this he said, okay, then we'll start doing this from 15th. And then these non-Buddhist teachers, you know, they said, okay, 15th, why he is choosing this 15th? He's choosing this because he will get some time so that he will run away. <laughs> Things like so it's a very, very interesting story. So anyway, a miracle happened. The Buddha, you know, won the competition, things like that. So now here, the one point that you need to know, what do you mean by miracle? Here, according to Buddhist philosophy, miracle is a meditative stabilization. It's your concentrated power that you are able to physically perform, you know, many things, like emanating water from your body or making your body disappear or emanating fire from your body and uh, emanating, you know, a huge conflagration of fire that the whole building with the Buddha and everybody is you know, engulfed by that, you know, fire, but then suddenly everybody comes out intact, no damage done, things like that. There are so many stories like that. So it's, it's miracle here, the English word, I don't know, but if the Tibetan philosophy, miracle means meditative concentration. This is different from emanation. Miracle is more of the mind, emanation is what is done by physically. Again, this is a huge subject to be studied. Just just for your knowledge. <coughs> so anyway, so the point that I'm making is, so in this month, such competitions and teachings from Buddha happened, and because of this, later on, the great uh, teacher Tsongkhaba, he reinstated this uh, practice of teaching and prayers for 15 days. And uh, it is said that Tsongkhaba one day also got a dream that he saw so many people around him flying into the space and disappearing. And then in the dream he says, why all these people are, where, where all these people are going? He said, because you did all these amazing things, they're all going to heaven, something like that, you know. So meaning that it, this is a very special opportunity to collect merit. There are, there are of course, many special occasions, but in the Buddhist text, four special occasions were mentioned, like the, when the Buddha got enlightened, you know, things like that. Okay, so occasion is also very important. Place is also important. Company is also important. Right? So therefore, uh, it's wonderful that uh, we are here together doing this very important occasion. And uh, so, with regard to these four seals, after Buddha got enlightened, completely enlightened, when he was requested to give the teaching by human beings and celestial beings, he did not accept it immediately. He said, I have found something 
which is profound, peaceful, free from fabrication, clear light, unconditioned. To whomever I teach it, nobody will understand it. Don't disturb me. Let me just continue my meditation. He did this few times. There is a reason to do that. There may be several reasons. One reason is that he was, of course, very confident of his teaching, and his, the teaching that he found was really profound, as he said. Profound, peaceful, unconditioned, clear light, all those things are there. So, as he was saying, it is not that easy for people to understand it. The second reason was, he wanted people to you know, regard his teaching as something very precious, and not to take it lightly. If you want to understand Buddha's teaching, there should be some seriousness. It's not just listening to a story, right? Seriousness means you really wish to remove your negative emotion, reduce your suffering, get more happiness, get enlightened. With this kind of determination, you should listen to the teaching. So therefore, the Buddha did not like, quickly accept it to give the teaching. Then again, the, the human beings and the celestial beings said, yes, yes, I, we know that your teaching is profound, very profound. Uh, but among human beings also, there are some who are quite intelligent. <laughs> so they may be able to understand a little bit. Please give the teaching. So when he gave the teaching, the first teaching that he gave us, the teaching on the Four Noble Truths, out of which the first was the truth of the suffering. This is important, truth of the suffering. This is important. This is important because I tell you a story. At the time of the Buddha, there was a monk by the name Malukya. He had already received some teachings from the Buddha. So one morning he was sitting in his meditative meditation heart and he started thinking that Buddha was very kind to me. I received a lot of teachings from him, but still there are a number of topics on which he did not answer. So unless he gave all the answers to all these questions, I will not feel comfortable to continue to follow him. I may go to other teachers. So with this mind, he goes to the Buddha and says those things. Then Buddha said, first of all, who told you to be my student? I'm not looking for student. Then as, as an answer to his question, he said, look, if somebody shoots an arrow from a from an unknown distance and hits your body, you are struck with the body, with that arrow on your body, and you are bleeding, what will you do? Will you immediately take the arrow out and do the needed medication? Or you refuse to take that arrow out, instead ask all the philosophical questions related to this event. Who must have shot the arrow? What was the... <laughs> How tall the person who shot the arrow? How strong uh, was his arm? Whether he is a mustache or not? And when the arrow was on the way, what was the speed? Huh? By what uh, material stuff the bow and the arrow made of? You know, you can even to this small event, you can ask hundred questions. You know, if you say Un unless I get all these answers, I'm not going to take medication. Long before you get the answer, you will be a dead person. So therefore, I'm not answering when did the universe started, where there is a life after death, all those complicated questions. I'm, I see so many sufferings among people, among sentient beings. So my job is to help reduce their suffering. So therefore, the first teaching that he gave was the foldable truth, out of which the first was truth of the suffering. <coughs> now, when he gave the teaching on the truth of suffering, it was taught with four features. The first feature was impermanence, which is also the first seal. All conditioned things are impermanent. This is very, very important. All conditioned things are impermanent. Whatever comes together will fall apart. If you don't want to die, don't be born. If you, if, that very birth itself is the cause of death. You see, so don't be shocked, don't be surprised, accept all this reality. All conditioned things are impermanent. So that was his first teaching. Then these four, four seals are supposed to have been taught by him when he was about to die. When he was passing away, he called some of his close students and he said, 
you know, if you have any question about the Four Noble Truth, about the dependent origination, about the two truths, you know, ask me. And then he finally gave this teaching on the four seals. So the point I'm making is the first teaching that he gave us on impermanence and one of the last teachings that he gave us on impermanence. This is very important. If you don't have a proper understanding of that, you will not make a move. We can talk about Dharma practice and so many things, but you will not make a move because you will, you will plan to continue to stay in the samsara. You will not try to make a move. For example, right now, you are visiting Dharamsala. Have you tried to buy a plot of land somewhere? Somewhere here? Huh? Some land, some house somewhere here? Unless you plan to stay here, you will not buy a plot of land or house. You prepare to go wherever you came from. So similarly, when you have this understanding of impermanence, you prepare for your journey whether your air ticket is confirmed, things like that, you see? So that's very important. That's really the motivating factor. So out of many types of impermanence, here we are primarily talking about the impermanence, here primarily talking about the death. Right? Death. If you want to understand life, understand death. Not just Buddhist teaching, let me read some of the Western thoughts. It's a very, very beautiful teaching, so I just wanted, I'm tempted to read it so that you hear both the sides of the story. The problem we are facing today. The loss of collective societal myths having to do with death and dying. That's what we are facing today. Second, the systematic devolution of anything to do with the spiritual side of humans. We live in a materialist world. So we, we hardly pay, pay, pay attention to the mind, to the spirit, the invisible things. We only focus on the concrete material things. Prior to the publication of Life After Life in 1975, the term near-death experience did not even exist. That's from Western point of view. Physicians called it the Lazarus Syndrome, a medical pathology. So many of this, the Thugdam practice that Tibetans are talking about, at that time they might say this is a Lazarus Syndrome, a medical pathology. Hallucination from drugs or lack of oxygen to the brain. <laughs> right? But they begin to realize that something very spiritual happens to us when we die. See, this is the finding. Gradually, in the beginning, okay, this is like a medical problem. Now, gradually, they are saying something very spiritual is happening. Dr. Moody's work reminded us that we are at our very core, at our very core, spiritual beings. And the fact that a loving light greets us when we die is proof of that. In Buddhism, in tantric practice, we call it clear light mind. Many of those people who wrote books, you know, on near-death experiences, they, they have, they have always, most of them have written that you enter into a light of tunnel and you are received by that tunnel, which is very soothing, very welcoming. Okay? Earlier, death became, no sorry, today, death became unnatural, dirty, nobody wants to die, right? Death became unnatural, <laughs> actually it is natural. Death became dirty, there's nothing dirty. Death means death of the body, there's no death of the mind, but we don't know this, so therefore death is dirty. And death is medicalized and hidden from the public view. The more and more we say we live in a developed country, the more it is difficult to see dying people. Whereas most people died at home in the 18s, 1800s, by the mid 20th century, most people died in hospitals. Death was something that was not discussed. Dying patients are subjected to the loving lie.
And then people were suffering from, because of this loving lie, people were suffering from loneliness and isolation that our societal fear of death caused them. Healthcare establishment dedicated to saving life, dedicated to, this is another important point, healthcare establishment dedicated to saving life, not facilitating death. Dedicated to saving life is okay, but it should also facilitate death. But that is not happening. Instead of death simply being, the, now the important point we need to understand is, instead of death simply being the extinction of life, according to his documentation, he documented that it is a spiritually dynamic time with life-transforming insights. Because death is summary of life. It's very intense. When on your deathbed, when you're passing away, your love is more intense. Whatever you experience, you know, hear a prayer, it's more intense. Listen to a music, it is more intense. You become totally a changed person. I read this story of this gentleman who is a guardian of that kind of, uh, at the crematorium near Ganges River. There's a kind of sadhu uh, who has a little house there to look after all those dying people. They come there. For example, I remember some story. There was one guy who was sure that he's going to die soon. He came there and he pleaded that, can you please call my brother? We had a misunderstanding and we divided the house with a wall. So before I die, I want to destroy this wall. Things like that. You completely change your you know, thinking and see the uselessness of how you misused your life, right? Then if you read this, The Will of Life, A Memoir, Memoir of Living and Dying by Elizabeth Kubler-Rose, it's a best-selling book on death and dying. If you live each day of your life right, this is the point, echoing the Buddhist teaching, if you live each day of your life right, then you have nothing to fear. Rest of my life, then, then therefore she dis, decided rest of my life, I'm going explaining that, uh, explaining that death does not exist in that sense. Modern medicine offering a life free of pain is nonsense. The only thing that truly heals people is unconditional love, which I said right in the beginning. When you are on your deathbed, you are surrounded not by howling, crying, shouting people, but surrounded by really loving people, right? It's very important. So therefore, if you have somebody who is really on the deathbed and dying, don't try to disturb that person. You put the image of a Buddha if it's a Buddhist, or image of a Jesus if it's a you know, Christian, or even a guitar, something that, you know, brings peace in the mind of that person. So don't disturb that person. Make sure that he dies peacefully so that he has a very smooth transit to the next life. Okay? Throughout life, we get clues that, that remind us of the direction we are supposed to be headed in, where? Dead. If you do not pay attention, <laughs> so this is what he's saying, Day and, day and night, we are running towards death. Even when we are sleeping, we are moving towards death. There's a beautiful stanza by one Tibetan master where he says, right from the birth, you don't have the control to pause even for a moment. And you are running with the greatest speed at the foot of the Lord of the Dead. Therefore, even though you call yourself alive, but you are on the national highway to death. Alas, is this plight of the criminal led to the place of execution. And in, in this other quotation from the, the 400 verses, those of you who are interested, please read the first four chapters of 400 verses by Arya Deva, which explains the four seals so beautifully. This book, 400 Verses, is one of my most favorite books. So there he says, whoever you are, the so-called 
life or being alive is just one moment. One moment of the mind, you are saying you are alive. And people don't know this. Therefore, there's nobody who knows themselves. We will say, of course, I know myself, but you don't know yourself because you don't know how, live you, how long you are living. So if you, if you are to be scared about death, you should be scared every day because every day you are dying. <coughs> Parts of your body are changing every day. Now scientifically they say after every seven years, you are completely, completely means completely, you are completely, you know, a different person. Complete transformation of your uh, body takes place. There is this story of a criminal who had heard about this. He was imprisoned and after seven years he said, now I am completely different person, please release me from the prison. <laughs> so that, that is the advantage of knowing the reality, you see. So now in my case, I'm 70 now, you know. So I already dead, really died the real death seven times already. Right? So there's nothing to be scared. Everything has to be understood. It's a question of understanding, not, not just getting uh, scared. Okay, there's so many things to read. I'll not read everything. So the first seal is anything that is, that is conditioned is impermanent. Anything that is conditioned impermanent is good news, bad news also. Bad news, of course, all the good conditioned things that are conditioned will also go. <laughs> Be bad, bad news. And good news means impermanence not only means death and uh, destruction, it also means flexibility, change, possibility to change. If things were static, permanent, there's nothing you can do. Your fate is sealed and decided, but that's not the case. So it's like, really like impermanence is like the stream, you know, stream. If you know how to, you know, swim with the flow, it will be all right, right? So that is the meaning, impermanence, anything conditioned. So don't get shocked when things change, okay? Second seal is, all contaminated things are suffering. Contaminated here means the negative emotions, afflictive emotions. Anything, whether it's an object or subject of mind, whatever, so long as it, it has this touch of negative emotion, it will lead to suffering. For example, if I see in the object, if I see a very attractive, beautiful Mercedes car, that is how nice if I get this Mercedes car and develop this obsession attachment, that object is called contaminated object. Right? Then also because of your thinking, the subjective mind, negative emotions also arise. Then also because of past conditioning. So there are many causes for this. Right? So if you don't want suffering, then don't keep in touch with the contaminated things or negative emotions as I already said earlier. Right? Third seal is all phenomena are empty and selfless. This is talking about the profound Buddhist philosophy. All things are empty can be explained from the viewpoint of all the four Buddhist schools Vaibhashika, Sautantika, Chitamatra, and then Madhyamika. So here you can you know, explain the meaning of emptiness according to their own philosophical system. But according to the highest system, which talks about both the selfness of the person and selfness of the phenomena, the person Gigamadhimika is saying that any phenomena, any existent phenomena, all phenomena means any existent phenomena, be it impermanent, be it permanent, anything that is conceivable, anything that is existing does not have independent, inherent existence. This is important. Now, why do we need to know this? We need to know this because although this is the way things are, but our 
ignorant mind sees things as having inherent independent existence. Therefore, we develop anger and hatred to some and love and uh, attachment to others. For example, if I like something, if I like something, again, the Mercedes car, if I like this Mercedes car, I will not only think this Mercedes car is good, but I'll think, wow, this is 100% good. Look at the color, look at the model, look at the space inside, you know, all those things, you exaggerate. <coughs> because of this exaggeration, you tend to develop obsession and develop strong attachment to that object. Then you get problem, that is called development of attachment. Contrarily, when you don't like something, for example, to the Tibetans, the Chinese leaders, I would not say Chinese people, but I would say Chinese leaders, because we don't like Chinese leaders because they, you know, thrown us out of our country. So therefore I would think, oh, the Chinese leader, they are like, the, they are like embodiment of all the negativities. It's impossible to have dialogue and negotiation with them. They are 100% horrible. They are not human beings. Most of us Tibetans might think like this, but then people who have Dharma, who have understanding, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know, he says, oh, let us dialogue. Let us have negotiation. You know, don't just keep on talking about the past history. Leave it to the past history, leave it to the historians. All is changing. Globalization is having, having taking place. Huh? The whole Eastern European country, which used to be communist, changed. Russia and, sorry, they were France and Germany, they were like, Sworn enemy, ready to kiss, uh, cut each other's throat some years back. Now they, they, are, they are together in the European Union using the same monetary system. You know, this is amazing. This is what he's always saying. So let important is future. We have to live on the same globe. In the case of Tibet and China, we are neighbors. So if you solve the problem through negotiation and dialogue, that's a real solution. But if you keep on killing each other, today you may win, next day, the other side will win, you see. So that will be like endless violence. That's not the solution, right? So therefore, don't see anything having, you know, unchangeable, independent, inherent existence. In Buddhism, we call it shunyata or emptiness. So emptiness is not equal to nothingness. Emptiness means empty of independent existence. Emptiness is like the mathematic, mathematical zero. Zero, if I say I have zero money in my pocket, which means you have no money at all, but in mathematical calcul calculation, zero is the foundation of all other higher calculations. Without zero, you can't have 10, 100, things like that. Right? So therefore, Nagarjuna, in, his, in one of his texts, beautifully says, to whom emptiness is possible, everything is possible. To whom every, no, emptiness is not possible, nothing is possible. Because emptiness means empty of independent existence. That means things exist. Things exist, everything is possible. Things exist and they have a dependent existence. Therefore, depending on causes and conditions, you can you know, produce anything. That's what he is saying. So all phenomena, without exception, empty and selfless. Okay, and the last is nirvana is peace. Nirvana is peace. Nirvana is peace through understanding that the root cause of samsara is ignorance, and through understanding that this ignorance, which is the root cause of samsara, is not just lack of knowledge but misconception of reality, and that misconception must be removed through wisdom, realizing the way things are, using the wisdom, realizing emptiness, and once you uproot that ignorance with the seed, that is liberation. So liberation is not a, you know, a special place where you go, travel. It's a state of your mind. Even right now, you may not have attended Nirvana, but if you move a little bit towards side, that side, that direction, reduce your negative emotion a little bit, you are very likely to get a small glimpse of that liberation, that Nirvana, that peace, that happiness. So that's the meaning.
four seals, briefly speaking. Okay? That is the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'll stop here. Ask some questions. If no questions, then we will <coughs> disperse. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yes, please. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This is hard to answer because this is happening in all the school curriculums, <laughs> you know, uh, very rigorous. But this uh, rigorous curriculum here is just for one week or so that is tolerable. But the main question is how rigorous you should be in your day-to-day -day life. I think, I suppose that's the question. So there I would say, yes, you need to make continuous effort. That, that is for sure. You need to make con continuous effort. But in Buddhism, effort means having delight in one's mind. Delight. Effort is not striving blindly, you know, pushing yourself at the edge, torturing yourself. No, that is not asked by Buddha. Although he also, Buddha, you know, undertook six years kind of penance. But after that he said, oh, this was going to the extreme. He concluded this is going to this extreme, so therefore he chose the middle way. Don't follow the one extreme of self-modification and also don't lead a life of, a pampered life of luxury in between. That's the answer, in between. You should, as you're a human being, you are not an enlightened being, so we all also need the rest, a little bit fun, jumping, singing, whatever, you know. That's, that's okay. But as I always say, your, your spiritual practice should be like moving on the national highway. Right? The main road. You should always be moving. But that doesn't mean to say that you can't have a break to have tea and lunch and dinner, things like that. So, <laughs> so all these things, you see. And then especially this, this mind, we call it monkey mind, you know. So you need to be a little bit tactful and skillful in bringing this mind to, to the right direction. Effort must be there. Effort, in the Buddhist teaching, it is said that effort must be like the, the flow of a river. In the case of flow of a river, it will flow continuously 24 hours. It will not say, okay, it's day, no, no, now daytime, I will flow. It's now nighttime, I will rest. The water will not say, it will continue to flow. So that means continue. Then there will be progress. But if you, if you expect that I attend this five days course, you know, and make this short-lived attempt, and then you expect this, boom, there is enlightenment? No. There is, in fact, there is a Tibetan teacher who said, for the first one or two days, you are so excited, you even forget to eat food, you practice very hard, and after three days, you forget all your practice and forget everything, such a person will get nothing. So continuity must be there, and with a, with a joyful heart. You need to like it. Many people ask this question. I'm, I want to do meditation. I want to do this. I'm not able to do. Oh, what is your answer, Geshe-la? I always tell them, you have to like it. Like a singer, like a player. You know, somebody, when somebody likes singing, somebody likes playing, they are unstoppable. Whenever they find time, they will sing, they will play. Whereas in our spiritual practice, unfortunately, the thing is, you know, you, you will say, I'll do my spiritual practice when I've ended doing all my you know, mundane activities. So that means you are living that spiritual practice as the, the least important thing. When you have not, nothing else to do, <laughs> then you will do the practice. No, that's the most important thing. Because at the end of the day, it is your mind which is ordering you, which is dictating you what to do, what not to do. So if you don't handle properly that mind, 
you will be led into a different, you know, negative direction. So that's the most important thing. Okay, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, you need to you need to plan those properly, because as I said, you know, sometimes they say they are very. They are, some people say they, I'm very interested with my spiritual practice. Then you forget the responsibilities of your family. You leave your wife behind, you know, and, and then also you adopt a little bit the manner of some Buddhist monk, or you know, with different hair and different. <laughs> this is like fooling oneself. You see, really, the important things. So wherever you, you go, occasionally, yes, occasionally you should charge yourself with your family, if you have family, or just yourself, one week, two weeks, or possibly one month, two months. Then, of course, you have to go back and earn your bread, you see, to be practical. But if somebody who is completely independent and also nothing have to worry about your financial resources, then, of course, you can then spend a lot of time doing those spiritual practices. But here also, I, I think you don't fool yourself. Because sometimes, you know, when there is nobody making problem, you have enough money to sit alone, looks good, you know. But then you are not so sure how much spiritual progress you are making, and you are not any more useful to the community. I, I would not recommend that. I would not recommend that. Right? Because sometimes what we do is, you know, you don't care about the people who are living around you. And then you pretend, I believe in the God who you have never seen, the Buddha who you have never seen. And you are ready, it's happening in the world today. You are ready to kill this fellow sitting in front of you who is living, breathing and smiling. Don't care about this person. And then pretending that you care about this, this the dictator of this so-called almighty God or Buddha sitting somewhere high. I call this just, just stupid. First, believe in things that you see, and then that will find, give you the way to the unseen energy. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Same. Yeah, same. Same. Only thing is, people are more complicated. <laughs> so you, you have to be <laughs> extra careful. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, the, the emotions are so strong with people, you know. Demand may be more, you know. Cars don't make any demand, they don't have any emotion, you know. So people and sentient beings, especially human beings, are. You have to be very careful. So therefore, therefore we say, when it comes to making connection with human beings, it should be like your connection to the fire. If you sit too close, it will burn you. If you stay too far away, especially in winter, you will not get the warmth, you see. That's important. Okay? And then also make a clear distinction between your unconditional love and attachment. Sometimes we have strong attachment and thinking this is my unconditional love. <laughs> no. That's not easy. Yeah. Okay? Any other questions? Yes? Huh? These ideas from the mind? Previous, this mind comes from the previous mind. Yeah. So according to Buddhism, they, we don't believe in a permanent soul. We, then, because when we say we don't believe in a permanent soul, then the next question they ask is, okay, then what goes to the next world? Our answer is, what goes to the next world is the mind. The mind is not permanent, but it is the continuity. The stream that goes keeps on changing depending upon what circumstances and conditions you encounter and then goes. Collecting with it all the wisdom, all the knowledges and things like that. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes, madam. Huh? How do you get rid of anger? Get rid of anger. You get rid of anger by thinking you are so beautiful. <laughs> if, if you get angry, you will become ugly like this. <laughs> you want to get ugly? You want to get ugly? So? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. All, all what? All emotions oh. are painful. All emotions are? Painful. Painful, no, no, no. Um, and if that's so, does that mean that, you know, negative emotions are painful, but is that sort of the suffering of change, that if you have a positive emotion, there's going to be a no, no, no. change of no, no. changes and that it will, you can't really cling to it? No. Yeah, you know, Different translators use different words. So it is, it is dependent upon what do you mean by emotion. But uh, according to my understanding, emotion, when we say emotion, is not necessarily negative emotion. Compassion is an emotion. Right? So they are, they are positive emotions. Now the only thing that is related to this question, I would say, is for example, in the case of compassion also, when you develop compassion, you develop compassion thinking, how nice if I'm able to remove the sufferings of all sentient beings. When you develop this mind, you get a little bit of uneasiness. I cannot call it pain, but a little bit of disturbance, a little bit of uneasiness. But this uneasiness is totally different from the pain that you get by developing attachment. Because when you develop attachment, anger and hatred, you are disturbed right from the very bottom of your existence, your thinking. When you develop compassion, you develop it voluntarily with reason. So you may have some concern, and because of this, on the, on the surface, there may be a little bit of disturbance and uh, care and concern, but deep down, it's like a huge ocean, you know, having some ripple on the surface, but deep down, calm and peaceful. So happiness falls into that category too, if you are supposed to be... Now, when you say happiness, you know, that so many, what, what level kind of happiness? There are contaminated happiness, uncontaminated happiness. Contaminated happiness, yes, produces painful. But uncontaminated happiness don't produce pain. So there are so many different levels. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for coming. Mm. Uh, looking at the wheel of life, yeah. the one you can you have all the six realms yeah. lead to some kind of suffering. Yeah. Yes, yes. But then, uh, in this human life, there are so many beings that largely live their life happily, more or so. <laughs> largely happily. They don't feel the need to liberate. Is it really necessary to feel the need to liberate? People think like that. People think like that. You reminded me a talk that I gave in the uh, Thomas Martin Monastery in Kentucky when I was a student many, many years back. I was talking something about suffering and something like that. Then there was a young lady, you know, with heavy cosmetics on her face. She said, why are you talking about suffering? I have no suffering. <laughs> you know? So, so then, you know, but you know what I said? I said, good luck. <laughs> that's, that's what we want. You see? But to answer your question, you know, we mistake facsimile happiness as true happiness. And in most of the cases, as I said right in the beginning, we are talking about pleasure, not happiness. Pleasure and happiness are totally different. Pleasures are mainly of the senses. Happiness is of the mind. Now the problem, this is a good question, because the problem with us is we are completely engrossed with the five or six sensual objects. And I have been telling people this is how the big malls sprang up. If you visit a big mall, the first floor is sands. 
next floor is you understand huh televisions form the next is touch clothes the next is restaurant taste next is cd dvd music you know these malls are constructed according to our need and this is explained in abhidharma long time back in the buddhist text and i was to connect these two after visiting a mall you know oh it's all here you know <laughs> <laughs> it's all there and then especially not only the 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 mall has you know is constructed according to our sensual needs but once you enter inside the mall there are many more interesting things you know things are arranged so beautifully and then it says buy one one free <laughs> so many things are there then you suffer from what we call as market intoxication or market coma shopping coma <laughs> shopping coma you see and a clear indication is that when when you when, when you enter inside you know there are many people going inside everybody is now in coma and then there is a peg of basket lying there and the the fellow who goes before you takes one bus basket no no probably not knowing what to buy what not to buy anyway she has to take a basket and you also follow suit you take a basket and you can't just keep on going around with empty basket then you see buy one one free you put one there one thing oh i don't need maybe my i give it to my friend whatever you end up and then finally the so called shopping is done you go to this stupid machine and uh, you give this to be uh, plastic card and you have no idea how much money many of us some may have many of us have no idea how much money is there in your plastic card and the machine does its job you know pulls all your money and then you say thank you very much okay then so cool check out and then put it in your car and reach your home unpack everything why the hell i bought this one <laughs> you see and and i read this in a in a in a book uh, in an article about the shopping coma and then later on i was reading a very old buddhist text it also says the same thing market intoxication <laughs> in big markets you know people forget about like other things people even lose their son children you know <laughs> because we are we are lost you see so the the point that i'm making is that today the whole world is lost in these five sensual objects everybody is running everybody says i'm busy it's not important you are busy important thing is what are you busy about you are busy in the pursuit of this sensual objects and mahatma gandhi said there is enough for everybody's need but not enough for everybody's greed and it is greed that is destroying the planet today look at the amount of pollution in big cities like delhi air pollution water pollution is not just delhi everywhere in big cities and who created this big pollution no tiger no lion no snakes but the so called intelligent human beings produce this pollution right and this pollution there because we have this unchecked greed i want more i want more i want more the business people you know your weakness so they keep on producing you know with the plastic package whatever you know we are suffocating the whole environment right and of covid-19 all this is a result of our unchecked greed and our misadventure with animals almost like 60 50% to job of human you know illnesses come from our misadventure with animals things like that <laughs> right yeah yes Huh? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like for example, the shunya that we are talking about is is permanent, not impermanent. All the abstract phenomena. For example, in in grammar we study, you know, some of the abstract qualities. White, whiteness. whiteness like emptiness is permanent because it's just abstract concept you know it is not conditioned okay hmm. yeah whoever yeah you already asked one question right yeah, yeah then the next one yeah
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now, now this, this is important because I don't know how much exposure you have with the Buddhist studies. Non-self does not mean there is no self. Self, of course, is there. That was my point. Things exist. You exist, I exist, self exists. Right? But the way you, I, and all the rest of phenomena exist is we exist by depending upon other factors, causes, and conditions. So therefore, there is no self, no I, which has independent existence, which is not dependent on causes and conditions. So therefore, when we talk about no self, we are talking about having no such self, which is not dependent on others. Those that are dependent upon others, that kind of self is very much there, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, the, 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 of course, you know, when you when you you know translate a word from one culture which is which has it is baggages into another culture which has it is baggages, sometimes there may be misunderstanding. So the word we use, like attachment desire, may have different connotation in different contexts and different languages. But basically, when we say don't have attachment, we say don't have attachment, reduce attachment, but we are not saying don't have desire in Buddhism. Because when we talk about desire, there is a positive desire, negative desire. Positive desire we need, the desire to become Buddha, the desire to be happy, you know. Nobody can stop you. So if you have money, buy things, enjoy, you know, who can stop you? But again, as I said, unless you follow the middle way, and if you pamper yourself, you see, then this will not help you. So it, higher, uh, no higher intention, not necessarily just benefiting others, but even taking care of your own health. Yeah. You know, because you have money, you consume all kinds of things, and especially eat junk food then. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, be temperate, that is, that is the I mean, word, I think. Have moderation, yeah, in everything, yeah. Uh, I understand you were in the for the, the Who said? <laughs> <laughs> somebody told you? Yeah. The bird, somewhere there, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, around yeah, six to seven years, yeah. I'm like a stone in the water, you know. Stone, stone in the water. If you put a stone in the water, it will not get drenched. On the surface, maybe a little bit water. <laughs> so like that, I may have worked with His Holiness for long, but it's difficult for me to say, oh, I was transformed completely, you know. <laughs> no, no. Because it's very difficult to tame your, your unruly mind. But having said that, yes, unknowingly, you picked up so many good things, right? For example, you know, I, I, I would not respect his soulless by saying he's the emanation of the, the compassionate deity, Avalokiteshvara, things like that. I would respect him more because of his humility. Somebody who is respected by millions of people, but still very humble, down to earth. That means he cares about others. So these are, for example, more important for me than believing that he's reincarnation of this, that, deity, and things like that, right? And, and he has committed his life in whatever way to help others, reduce people's suffering. I mean, what, what else you want, you see? That's the thing. No discrimination about people, country, nation, including the Chinese, whatever, you know. Whenever he sees people saying bad things against him, doing wrong things, he would say, oh, poor thing, oh, poor thing, <laughs> you know. He feels concerned, you know, he's never angry or anything like that. So that's amazing. 
Yes. Да. Yes. Yeah, it, it, as, as far as the, 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 the perennial philosophy or universal messages of Buddha's teaching is concerned, it's applicable to everybody. So, you, for example, if you practice the, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, you don't have to hang on to the Tibetan cultural clippings, like sticking out your tongue, <laughs> which they used to do before, and the Chinese are making fun of it. It has its own beautiful story. But uh, then also in Tibet, when we were in Tibet, we used to, Tibet being a cold climate, you used to this wear, you know, fur-lined, you know, thick, you know, jackets, things like that, which you don't have to wear here, you know. So some of these cultural clippings are redundant, you see. When we change the climate, change the place, you think, change things. But there are core values, like compassion, applicable to everybody. Patience, applicable to everybody. Universal brotherhood, sisterhood, you see. So at the core, we are all the same. Wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. So it's important to, you know, that's why His Holiness, of course, when He's requested to give a teaching, Buddhist teaching, He gave a Buddhist teaching, but otherwise, for the benefit of the majority, He talks more about the secular ethics, universal ethics, which is not based on any particular religion. This is important. Before you say, I'm a Buddhist or I'm a Christian, you should have this human decency, basic human norms of kindness, cooperation, harmony, you know, easy to deal with. Those things must be there. But unfortunately, sometimes we call ourselves as a Buddhist practitioner, then later on you become very arrogant, you don't even have the basic human decency, <laughs> things like that. So that, that, that is a little bit hypocrisy. So I always tell people, Think globally, act locally. Help the people around you. Then talk about peace of the world. If you keep on talking about the peace of the world, never care about your, <laughs> your roommates <laughs> and neighbors, you know. It's easy to talk about world peace. The problem is the next door neighbor. <laughs> okay. It's too long for me to understand. <laughs> huh? Okay. Anyway, anyway, I think I got the essence. <clears throat> there is a saying, when you see the sentient beings afflicted by karma, the result of karma, this is supposed to have been said by Buddha, Ananda, when you see sentient beings afflicted by suffering, do not lament. When you see sentient beings afflicted by suffering, don't lament. This is not to say don't, don't take responsibility, don't show concern, but it is for, on, for practical reasons, you cannot solve the problems of everybody. Do you have this uh, statue of our Lokiteshwara, living faced here? No. So we have a statue of Avalokiteshvara with 11, 11 heads. The story goes like this. That deity of compassion, Avalokiteshvara, made a promise saying that I will remove sufferings of all sentient beings. So every day he delivers many from their suffering. Next day he goes, he finds similar amount waiting there. 
He helps all of them. And it goes there, next time again more, not less. So he continues to, you know, continues to do like that, and then he gets completely like, today, these days we call about emotional fatigue or something like that. <laughs> so he was completely tired, said, I give up. It's impossible to solve the problems of all of these people. Because he broke this big promise, his head split into 11 pieces. The story says, it may be symbolic. Then the Buddha Amitabha, he comes and says, my son, my spiritual son, don't, don't break your promise, don't get discouraged. I will always be there with you. Continue your practice, cultivate bodhicitta. Then he brings these 11 pieces together and from which he makes 11 head. On top of which you will see the head of the Buddha Amitabha. So this is, this is not to say that, you know, give up your compassion or bodhicitta, things like that, but for practical reasons, you know, you will not be able to solve everybody's problem at one go. Even Buddha could not do that. If he had done that, now we should not have any problem. Right? But this does not mean to say you cannot minimize their problem. Right? So that, that's the point. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So we stop here with this message. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, are, you are very good. I was, I was waiting for an exit point. <laughs> so, the last message, take away message is, whatever may come in your life, be always happy. <laughs> this is important, because when you are happy, you can solve all problems. All right. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much, Keshela. Always. Okay. Good to see you. Thank you so much, Keshela. Please come back very, very soon, and thank you so much. Oh, I thought she was going to say, please come back for dinner or something like that. <laughs> now, we have, now we have beautiful cake. <laughs> I don't want to make them jealous. <laughs> thank you so much, thank Keshila, you, for joining you. us in this very special time, thank you. Days of Miracles. Thank you. Wonderful. And uh, Geshela comes back very soon uh, in, in May. April. May, May. In May. Oh. No, we changed around, Geshela. Oh, yeah, yeah, to yeah, April, yeah, April yes. uh, For a course on the Four Seals and Lama Tsongkhapa's Three Principal Aspects of yeah, the Path. Yes. Uh, so if you got a taste and you liked it, uh, then please come back for that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody. It's now 4.50, so you have about 40 minutes of break for your, until your 5.30 meditation. So please, please enjoy the sun, have some tea and relax, and come back at 5.30 for the session with Venerable Tsomo to meditate.